Hey everybody, there's so many <laughs> great seats right up here. And I'll I'll tell you a secret. Kate doesn't think it's cool when you sit on the tables in the back and work on your homework when someone came here to talk to us. Just a pro tip. But really, there's like the, the four coolest people in the room would look great in these chairs. <laughs> Maybe they're not here. Okay. Okay. Welcome. Today is a special day because we're here with Public Library. And Gabby made the poster the box. Gabby? Man, if you were in the front, I would have called that out. <laughs> uh, I have lunch up front, too. I love watching people eat lunch. Is that something you guys like? Oh, yeah, they love it. <laughs> Bring your food. All right, a few quick things. Sophomores, suck it up. Info sessions are coming. It looks like Tuesday, March 10th, Wednesday, March 11th, and Wednesday, April 8th. Any sophomores in here have no idea what that means? Okay, good. And it's also going to be in the poster say 320, but it's going to be in room 160. Ooh, twist. So it's correct on the blogs and it's correct on the websites, but um, it's not correct on the posters. And that's not your fault, not. So we don't care. Okay. <laughs> cool. So not room 320. Not room 320. Room 160. 160. 12 to 2. You have to go in order to go through review. And you have to go through review to be a successful adult. <laughs> um, this, we're putting on a cool little, oh yeah, Adam Garcia is here, the pressure's here, Anton's here. <laughs> they're, they're our guests next week, so they're spying. <laughs> that was not a sneaky way to enter All right, back to the program. What day is this? Also Tuesday, March 10th. You've gone to your uh, sophomore portfolio review info session. You're feeling confident. You want to learn more. You can go to this great lecture from Jolie and friends at Sakai Creative at 7 p.m. It's only $5 if you're a student. No, it's, it's free if you're a student. Oh, it's free if you're a student. It's yeah. $5 if you bring your parents. Sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, all the money is going to the program. Who knows what fun we'll have with it. Going to be about ideation and process. Lastly, uh, we've got some amazing use of stock photography here, <laughs> and also a really cool conference about the business of design, uh, organized by UCDA, and also some alumni of this program pitched in. Um, but there's going to be a whole day of workshops about business. Uh, Presenters include people we know, like Will Bryant, who teaches here, Bologna Sandwich, who teach here, Jen Armbrust, Jen Wick, and Caleb Yerian, who have all done show and tells here. So it's familiar faces. And there's a priority cheap registration for students, but you have to do it really soon, like this weekend. March 6th. March 6th. Friday, Friday tomorrow. Um, so if you want to get the cheap tickets, do it by tomorrow. I think that was our, our full around the world. Anything else important? Anyone have anything to share? OK, cool. Let's get to it. So Public Library is a cross-disciplinary design studio in Los Angeles, California, and Portland, Oregon. Founded in 2011 by Ramon Coronado and Marshall Rake as a space to create work that translates thought and intent into meaningful solutions Let's welcome them, Public Library. Uh, my name is Ramon Coronado. I am also Ramon. No, I'm Ramon. Um, thank you guys for having us. This is Ramon's turf. He is the Portland half, and I am the LA half. Um, and I love to come here and eat your delicious food and drink your beers. Um, so this is really exciting. Uh, what we want to do is take you through some of our work, but more importantly, some of the things that we have learned and accidentally learned, and how that translated into the work that we make. We are a 
a design studio, I guess. Um, we do a lot of different things, and we're always hesitant to say we do graphic design because if I say we do graphic design, someone says, okay, you guys make logos or you make posters or you design graphics. Um, and then what else are you going to talk about? What does that really mean? What is making a logo? You don't just sit at home or sit in the studio making a bunch of logos for shit. It has to mean something. It has to have context. And that's why all of these different titles that people are don't really mean anything without the context that it's applied to. So I can tell you for sure that we are public library and we are here speaking. And that's what we know. Here's some people that we've worked with and we work with now. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about our backgrounds and how we kind of came about this and this whole thing. Both of us went to Art Center College of Design, which is in LA. And when we graduated, I moved to New York because I wanted to I wanted to design books and I wanted to do print. And New York is cool and I wanted to be there. Um, but I also knew I had a ton to learn, and I wanted to work in as many places as I could. So I think I worked in like 10 studios in the first year that I was there. Um, because every time I learned something, I wanted to learn a little bit more. And then I got kind of obsessed with learning about like how, do, how does the studio structure their files? Like what is their folder structure? And things like this that start, they're not really about the work, but at the same time, what creates the order and the environment that allows them to create the work that they are creating. Um, and all these different things started to become interesting. At the time, web design started to become really interesting. A lot of print opportunities were getting smaller. And the web was this weird question mark where people started to do some, some kind of weird things and started to become more exciting. And so I decided, OK, now I want to learn web, but I didn't get a chance to study it. So why not just say I know how to do it and get a job doing that? And then I can decide if I like that. And it's like, well, maybe I don't like this, but I might like that. Um, and just hoping each time to learn a little bit more until I got to the point where I figured the best way to learn was to try learning it on my own and what are the problems created around that. Pretty much covered it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So one of the other things about us is we live and work in two different places. So um, there's really great things that come about that because Ramon and I start projects together. We don't know, I don't know what he's starting. So if we're working on a new branding project or working on some new concepts, Ramon just starts on what he wants to do and I just start on what I want to do. And we're not influenced by what the other person is doing. So I don't see the typeface he's using and say, oh yeah, that looks good. I'll just do that. I can develop my own weird or my own terrible thing and come back and say, well, thank God Ramon's here. This is a, a good direction. <laughs> But it starts creating this weird game of telephone almost where we're working on the same project independently. And then once we get somewhere, we sometimes we'll switch designs and he won't tell me what he was doing and I'll just pick it up and see what happens. Um, and a lot of times that weird hybrid and Frankenstein mashups start to create really unique and weird things. Sometimes it works out great and other times we start over. Um, but it's given us a good opportunity to do that and develop a distinct style that way, but it also has allowed us to grow two separate client bases and become parts of two different communities and two super different communities. The you know, design community up here is super close. LA, like the city, is really spread out and uh, very kind of independent. So with all that being said, this is what we've kind of figured out so far. Similar problems deserve different solutions. So you guys probably have started to notice this. You get a brief, you're branding something, you're creating a website for something. These projects tend to overlap. They're similar problems. You need to make them, you need to make a logo that can be produced at this size, and at this size, it needs to move, it needs to do whatever. A lot of these things tend to be the same. So for not only for giving the client something exciting, but how do you keep yourself engaged in that? How do you not just turn in the same logo 10 times? How do you not just make the same website 10 times? 
because they're actually you have to start investigating and figure out okay why why are these two companies different why do they both exist they both exist they're both businesses they've gotten to the point where they need someone to brand them and someone to identify what they do to the outside world and your job is to pull apart whatever minutia makes them different and show that and i think that really came into focus for us this past year we were working on three projects at the same time that happened to be really similar there were three creative agencies that did a lot of video work you know they needed a new identity they needed a new uh, portfolio they needed kind of to understand who they were and they were all very different people that weirdly overlapped so we didn't want to just turn out the same thing over and over again because one that's like super boring and two it's not fair to them so the first project uh, is called red and this is a representation agency for directors in LA so they rep like David Fincher and a lot of really really great directors um, they also do something that most people don't know exists like who knew that director groups have specific agencies that represent them not a lot of fans of that very specific genre but it's super important and it's how things get done and um, bringing to life something like that that you need to like, introduce an identity for something that people don't even understand to begin with starts to be a whole different challenge um, the next one is Priestley, which was, go for it, all right, you're, kind of, you're killing it right now. He's my silent hype man. Um, Priestley is Portland based, he's a creative producer, he's a really unique personality, he does really cinematic, beautiful work, um, and kind of the thing that excited us was, was him, and the way he spoke about work, I remember you know, we were doing these other projects that were similar and then talking about it, like, oh, I don't know, like, do we want to do this again? And we got on the phone with him, I was like, God, I just want to talk to this guy and find out more about what's making him tick. And like, it's a ride that you want to be a part of. Like, he's doing awesome things. These clients are doing awesome things. Like, we get to be a part of that. We get to help them discover these things that they can't talk about. You know, it's like, it's speaking a new language and you hear someone do it and you're like, I want to talk like that. Um, and then the other part of this group was Switzerland, and they're a creative agency up in the Pacific Northwest. Some of the first members of the group were like early Wyman Kennedy people, so they've been creating high-end work for you know, decades. And the interesting part about them is like they've been through this all before. You know, they've seen the trends, they've seen them recycled. They're so in it that it's hard to sometimes step back and see what you're really about, what you're really speaking to. And for us, that was a really kind of exciting thing was to turn the tables on them and say, well, this is like, this is where what you guys are. This is what you should be. And then seeing that kind of spark in them and um, being able to show that off to them and again, be a part of that was really exciting. Yeah, because I think we were working on Priestly and Red at that time, and then this one came in, and we were kind of like iffy about it just because it's the same project again. Like, you know, um, what are we gonna do this time? But what was what was cool was that they were so kind of like old school and like stuck in their ways that it was fun to like kind of like teach them about the internet, you know, and like you know they they just they didn't have a website, they didn't know anything about it. Um, and it was a really fun process, you know. It's a lot of what we do is, you know, a, a big part of it is um, actually educating your client. You know, they don't exactly know what's going on in the design world and all the different facets that, like, a website. You know, it has to look good on Retina, it has to look good on an iPhone, it has to look good on Android, it has to fucking open an email, like all that stuff that they just don't realize. To them, it's just like, oh, it's a website, put it up. Um, so, just walking through the. So, yeah, you can start to see how similar we're dealing with video content, we're dealing um, with showing commercials and showing spots, bios, contacts, all these things that overlap, but you start to get a very different feel for you know, who these people are. So, there's no 
I mean, I think that's just the way we approach just about any project. There's no real system to it. It's you have this very specific client that has his own, you know, very specific way of doing things and their work and their portfolio and who they are and trying to capture that personality through, you know, typography and letter spacing and photography and compositions. Um, and that's how, you know, we arrive at these solutions. <laughs> <laughs> and the, you get exposed to such cool work working with people like this. You, know, actually, wow. you, you, get, you spend so much time with your portfolio. It's it's really fun to get to you know work. <laughs> so this is something that we kind of touched on in the in the beginning: is define yourself only creates limits. So the second you say what you are, you kind of take yourself out of the game for a lot of things that you could be. Um, and a lot of things that we loved doing were things that we probably weren't qualified to do, but we weren't really worried about that. Um, I remember when I graduated from school, I totally ignored applying to any job that had requirements, because those are for other people. You know, like why? The worst thing is they're going to say no. The best thing is they're like, well, oh, maybe this guy is qualified. Um, and that's something that we really believe in is that you know you walk in and say, well, I know graphic design, and I don't have time for anything else because that's what I know. Um, what if you decide you want to get into doing commercials, or if you decide you want to do interiors for restaurants? All these things that lead into design and graphic design, um, but it's important to not kind of shackle yourself unnecessarily. So a project that was kind of a, a good thing for this is um, we got involved with the town of Greensboro, Alabama. And that is one of the poorest towns in, in one of the, the poorest county in Alabama, which makes it one of the poorest places in the United States. And there's not a lot of jobs. There's not a lot of money. But Alabama is weirdly the perfect place to grow bamboo. So there is a ton of beautiful bamboo in Alabama, just fields and fields of it. and. There's a history of craft and workers there. And so we kind of had these two things, and um, we worked with, do you guys know who John Bielenberg is? He is an amazing designer. He started this thing called Project M. If you are interested at all in kind of design for good or the power of thinking and what it can do outside of what we're used to doing, definitely look into him. He's also just an amazing person um, who we work with a lot. but. This is something he was really invested in. And we said, OK, we have these two things. Let's think of a product. Let's think of a business. How can we create jobs? And we started this bike company called Semester Bikes that uses the locally grown bamboo in a workshop that you literally cut the bamboo in the back, walk it down Main Street, bring it in the front door, and build a bike. Um, and we worked and developed a business plan. We worked on strategy. And you know. We also designed logos and shit. But the bigger creative problem was how do we solve a real issue? How what can we do? And it's the same way you tackle a design problem, just it's something different, it's a different muscle. Um, and the workshop's up and running, people have jobs, it's this thing that exists, um, and it's a really, really awesome place. Another one you guys might have seen around town is uh, this bar Big Trouble. And it was kind of a, this like experimental pop-up collaboration we did with Chef's Table um, that had a really unique set of limitations when we got involved with it. Yeah, um, yeah, they came to us and they their bar before kind of tanked, so they have like two weeks to reopen something new. So two we weeks had, is a very short time to <laughs> open a restaurant. <laughs> so two weeks to flip a restaurant, come up with a whole new brand, new website, new menu, drinks, um, no money um, at all. So um, uh, to us, it was like we got the opportunity to, to the opportunity to do whatever we wanted, and we kind of like um, you know we had a meeting with them and. If we were allowed to have full control of the branding, then sure, we'll take it. That'll be a fun portfolio piece. So, you know, just based on kind of the area and uh, what was around there, we were just influenced by, you know, the other restaurants around. There's like Good Taste, then there, you know, you keep walking down. There's a couple other Chinese spots where you see like the stretched out aerial type everywhere, and you know, you get the 
awesome plastic bags with the thank you in red. <laughs> um, and that's really what drove this whole Grandian project. For us, it was just really fun to flip this in like two weeks. Um, sad to say it closed uh, <laughs> on Monday. <laughs> but I mean, for us, it was an awesome portfolio piece. We had a ton of fun in a week. Um, but yeah. Uh, okay, this was this is a really big one that we feel very. If you don't, if you you can forget everything else we say, don't. But it's like <laughs> super, think about this one when you go home. Um, you never leave money on the table if you believe in what you're doing. And this one is really hard to swallow, especially like coming out of school, and especially when someone shows you a lot of money. Um, but you have to think about your career and think about design as a really, really long game, like really long. And the things you're doing now are already starting to echo out into your future. The people that you're meeting at school, your, your teachers, the places you're going to and interacting with, all these connections that are starting to establish. Um, and what's going to start to happen is you're going to be presented with opportunities. You're going to have maybe there's a job that you don't really want, but it pays super well. And then maybe there's this thing with an art gallery that pays nothing, but you get to make the work you believe in. You have to think, OK, if I'm making the work I want to make, what if someone sees that as doing something a little bit more than what they're doing? And maybe I can start to make a little bit of money doing this. Maybe someone sees that second step. Then your third step, you're making more money. You know more about yourself. You know more about design. And by that fourth or fifth step, you're creating the work you want to make, with the people you want to make, and the environment that you want to make. Instead of, well, I took this job for money. I don't want to show the work, so I'm not proud of it. I can show you the stuff I bought. That's super cool. Um, and that's definitely you know, something from experience with working at so many places. There was stuff that I did because New York is really expensive. And that sounds terrible. No, like design <laughs> jobs that I did. Uh, and you don't show the work. There's tons of stuff I spent hours working on and no one has ever seen it. I don't no one knows that I did it, whatever. It's it doesn't it doesn't matter to me. It's not like something you care about. And as designers and creative people, we might as well balance books or do something else if we're not creating work that we're proud of. Um, so that's something we're always thinking about is we will do projects for free or we'll do projects for super expensive, you know, for more money. Um, but we only do things that we believe in because of what that next step is. And I think if you just keep thinking about what's next, it keeps things exciting, and it also puts things into perspective. Um, this is one a longtime client of ours, David Harry Stewart. And when we first met him, he was transitioning from one type of photography to a different style. So he was kind of going through something. And he was he's one of our first clients yeah. when we first opened up. Um, and he he's in LA, and he was really sick of the, the circuit, the gauntlet that photographers have to run. They have to do these like portfolio review things where they spend like a thousand dollars to sit in the booth, and agents come around and go, "Ooh, I like this," blah, 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 blah. and they go to the next one. You spend all day there, and you paid money to show your work and be criticized. Um, design school, <laughs> <laughs> and then to get into ad agencies and the art buyers. You know, how do you crack into that in a different way? Um, and we were like, well, let's just let's print a lot of your posters and put them all over the city. So um, this one, you know, we put on a tree, but there was one specific event that he wanted to kind of give a middle finger to. And there was a specific place you parked at and a specific place that the event was held at. And we put the posters all the way on the sidewalk from the parking lot to the front door. <laughs> and he started doing this more and more with agencies he wanted to work with. And he started getting phone calls, he started getting emails, and he started getting to work. And it's just, it was really exciting to work with someone that wanted to do something weird, but something that they believed in and something um, that they just wanted to try. Uh, Walked and Warren, this was an e commerce site that we did, and it, kind of a, it was kind of an experimental idea anyway. Um, and we hadn't done an e commerce at the time, and it was. It's kind of a, a whole new beast compared to other web design, other kinds of digital storytelling. Um, and so we worked on, well, how do we feel the shopping experience would be? What, 
what do we think could be here? And it, it was just like a huge learning tool for us. And again, this was something that got featured in a lot of places, was printed in a lot of places. It's super weird when books and magazines print websites because they look like so dated immediately. <laughs> um, but they, they like doing it. So thank you for printing the books. <laughs> um, this was an event we did here for Design Week Portland. Um, we spent a lot of time, a lot of studio hours to build an event um, really like the ultimate user experience is actually experiencing the users. And so we wanted to print up a lot of work that we've done and never got to the show and make this thing to be a part, more a part of the community that you guys have here. Um, and it was really fun. There's people that we only, you know, correspond to online a lot. Um, and other things that you get to sit down with and talk to and have a beer and show your work or talk about their work. Um, and these things that just, you, you do because you want to do it. You don't worry about the immediate payback. You think, I'm smart, right? Everyone in here kind of values themselves. And this is what I want to do. So someone will value that. That will echo out. Another thing we like to do is stretch the truth. <laughs> Assume the truth. Um, say you can draw. Say you can do it. Because you're going to hear really great projects that you want to do. And you just like, maybe you can't quite do what they're asking. But that doesn't mean that you couldn't do it, or that you don't know someone that could do it, or that it's not going to be super fun to figure out how to do it. Um, and one of the, our favorite ones of this is, is drawing. Um, drawing is really tough. And if you're good at it, it's such a beautiful skill. Um, my dad is an industrial designer, and I really want to do it. I, just, I couldn't draw, and it was, you know, I guess it's his, the genetics weren't strong enough. Because <laughs> um, I tried super hard. But, this, this kind of came through because of Rasa, which is a restaurant here that is really good. Um, and when we were working with Rick, who is the chef, he wanted this eagle, this beautiful, beautifully illustrated eagle, which of course is something that we do, is draw eagles. <laughs> um, but we wanted to draw it. So, well, just to add, I mean, that was, this was, one of our fit, like first Portland projects, so we really wanted to like get into Portland. We were still most of our projects were just in LA, so I mean, yeah, why not? We can fucking draw an eagle. Figure it out. <laughs> um, and and yeah, it was so a many eagle. fucking nightmare. Because <laughs> neither of us can draw very well, and it sucked. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it took a ton of work. Um, eagle looks great, I think. I think the proportions are right. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it, it was about, you know, just being uncomfortable and just saying you can do it, um, you know, and just being hungry and really, you know, wanting to go for it. Um, it was a good learning experience, for sure. What you talk about. So another, in the same line of thinking, is we were approached to do a mural in LA, and being outside and away from the computer is something that we really love doing, and if we can, I mean, if you can hang out for two days outside with your friends, like, Painting shit. That's pretty good. Um, so we approached this mural, and, I, and we were talking about it. We were designing. And like, we'll do something really simple, like geometric shapes. That's super easy, right? Has anyone painted a mural with geometric shapes? It's impossible. <laughs> you want straight lines. Look, like you don't want to see messy. You you want to make a mural that looks like a human being did not make it. Like the beauty of hand done. You want it gone. You want this weird alien organism landed and it was a mural. And that's the goal. And we didn't realize that. We're like, yeah, this is it. We sold it to the client. And we were like, wait, so if you tape off one side, then you paint over the and, <laughs> and we figured it out. And it was it was awesome. You know, we were running the hardware store, we were getting different kinds of mats, different ways to block paint, different ways to dry, um, really tall ladders. This thing is like 15 feet tall. 30 feet wide. It's a huge mural. And um, it came out great. And I just, like, I go there sometimes and just look at the edges. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's not design. It's not admiring the logo. It's things that we want to do. And we figured out how to do them because it was fun. And that's why, that's why we get in this. Um, except the good. This is another one that uh, Ron and I both have this poster hanging in our studio um, because 
it's really important. And we often get bogged down with negativity, and it's super fun to bitch and complain about stuff. But you kind of have to step back a little bit and think about, OK, yeah, 90% of this stuff is terrible. But that 10% could be really beautiful. It could be really great. Um, and one of a, a big lesson for us was working with someone that we really like, which is Drake. So early on in our studio, we got this email that I was sure was spam, but it wasn't. Um, and they wanted us to help rebrand and reposition October's very own, which is Drake's brand. Um, and we're like, OK, yeah. Well, um, and it turned out to be real, so that was good. But <laughs> the thing is, is you're so you're making all this stuff. You know, we're working on single release art and logo animations and web design and branding and all like tons of things. And you know, two percent ends up being used, right? Or they get changed so much that they stop being the thing that you made. And you have to step back because that can be really frustrating. Because you're like, well, I made this. I know. I know why this design works. It's not just a piece. Um, but then think about it backwards and deconstruct and say, well, it's a really big change to go from, this is, for Drake fans, this is pre nothing was the same. So this was back when things were the same. So this, um, <laughs> so his brand was very different than it is now when we see really minimalistic type and crops and black and white. All of these things they weren't doing before. And now they are. So while this artwork didn't end up existing fully, things that we were doing still are in there today. And um, those little pieces are things that you have to hold on to, because it's going to happen a lot when you're working at agencies or whatever. Maybe they just end up using a color that you picked. Or maybe they're not even a photo, but the photographer that you found. And you can get mad at the 90%, or you can say, yeah, I'm the I found the fucking photographer, so what did you guys do? Um, but those little moments can really can really mean a lot. Um, believe in alternate realities or embrace the bad, which is like now a movie that I want to make. Um, but this kind of goes hand in hand with this, because there'll be things that you work on or things that you want to do that get killed, or projects you lose, or clients that fire you, or things that just don't work out. And they can really be a bummer. Um, we were just working on a pitch that was like, we don't we don't usually pitch. And a project came to us that was really exciting. It was big. It was like a year-long single project um, that would, you know, would have funded the studio for a year. We could have just done one project. And we're like, we liked it. It was cool. It was something we wanted to do. And we're like, OK, we'll pitch on it. The pitch ended up taking about five months, which is a really long time. So we're doing presentation after presentation, big, long PDFs. You know, you're know, you creating different timelines and different schedules, different lists of deliverables, contracts, contract reviews, all of this stuff. Um, you go present in person. You present on, you're, you're doing a lot of things. You're putting a lot of energy. And then you know you get a phone call that's like, "Hey, second place is pretty good." <laughs> um, and that you know that moment can be hard because you have, you're like, "Well, maybe we're not good. Maybe someone else is better. Maybe we fucked up. Um, or maybe now we can do something else. Maybe now we have flexibility we wouldn't have had. Maybe uh, we can start discovering new things that we want to do. Maybe we can learn to draw." Um, but all these bad opportunities allow can allow good things to happen. It's just you have to get past the fact that shitty moments happen. This is an old one, but money, time, control. You can have two of these. You cannot have three of them. So projects usually will pay a lot. You'll get a great timeline, a lot of time to do it. You'll get a control, be control of the creative side. Um, two of those you can usually have. So you can have money and all the time to do it. You can have creativity and time, but you're probably not going to get all three. Um, and identifying the two that you want per project is really important. This was a project we did. Um, it was a post campaign 
for South by uh, South by Southwest a couple years ago, and it's this really cool uh, artist agency, and they want to do like a wild posting campaign. Um, so we got to make these like really crazy posters, and we got to make them really fast. Um, and it's not ideal scenario, but it was fun working with them. We made something we liked. Um, this was a kind of like a jack of all trades creative coffee shop dance studio that <laughs> we used to do a lot of work with and their owner is a super creative kind of out of the box guy and I mean as you can see it was basically like type experiments that got printed into things. So this goes back to like we were we still had full time jobs and you know we had already started the conversation of public library and not having anything to show. So, you know, we took on these clients that didn't pay anything, but we got to do whatever we wanted. And um, I mean, this was like the start of it really was, you know, this, this project was kind of what, um, you know, got us into like blogs and all this shit. And like from that, you know, more clients started coming in. Um, so <laughs> that was a good experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, pause input, resume output. Design has become very reactionary. When you get a project or you, you know, your teacher says, this is what you're gonna do, you automatically have an idea, kind of, of what it's gonna look like, right? You're like, well, I wanna do this, or I've been inspired by this lately, I wanna try something like this. We get moving so quickly and we're so quick to go that we're often kind of forgetting to inject ourselves in it or allow us to be a part of the process. Um, and so stuff that we, internal projects are really important to us is saying, we don't want to do your stuff today. We're going to do our stuff today because it gives us time to work through things or to try new things, to discover problems or try and just try. Um, so this is when we went to Alabama the first time. Um, I'm from Kansas and Kansas is weird for a lot of people. And then has anyone been to Alabama? Alabama is like a whole, I love Alabama, but it is like a different planet, right? I mean, <laughs> it's so beautiful and so different that as soon as we drove there from, from my hometown of Kansas, Alabama, and we just started you know, taking pictures, we started writing down everything that we saw um, because it was such, a, it was a life-changing experience going down there and spending all that time. And we're like, we, gotta, we wanna do something with this. So we just, we made a book about our thoughts and feelings and <laughs> it became really important to us and then another thing that we have slowly been doing is is thinking about flags and trying to take the elements of a flag and reconstruct them and redo them just because we wanted to we wanted to make some physical objects so we did these canvas print California flags uh, do good things and good things will find you so it, along with that line, um, for a couple of years, I was making a calendar for the new museum in New York. And leading up to public library, I had done two. I was like, OK, cool, we'll do a new one. And so we made this calendar, printed it out, sent it to them. And they're like, hey, we don't want this. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Our collaboration uh, didn't work. <laughs> they didn't like it. They didn't want it. So we were stuck with all these calendars. We're like, well, that kind of sucked because I was, you know, you work as a museum, you're working with this really cool, you know, you make these beautiful objects, and they're like, no, you don't want it. Um, so we we ended up sending them to people, you know, we threw it on the website. And um, are you guys familiar with the band Yacht? They're from Portland. So Jonna emailed me and was like, hey, I really liked your calendar. Can I have one? I said, okay, cool. So I sent it one. And I was, at the time, I had heard some of their music, but I wasn't like super familiar. And um, then I started listening to it more and more, and like, came into it. He's like, "Hey, I love this calendar. Will you? We're going to Japan next week. You want to make a T-shirt?" Like, okay, cool, yeah. Like, well, that's fun. Like, fan shirt. And so he made a shirt really quick for them. And then you know, didn't hear from them because they were in Japan. Mm -hmm. There's no internet in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> and then they came back and they're like, "Hey, we had this idea." And you guys make apps, right? And of course, we said yes. <laughs> um, and we started this project with them called Five Every Day. And it's this app that is anti 
algorithm, human-based recommendations of five unique things to do in LA every day. So they present this idea, and we totally were totally in love with it. We got to make an app, and I am really not a technology dude, and I don't like apps. Mm -hmm. And so we were stepping back and looking at this app as like, from a point of view of someone who doesn't like using apps but wants this content, what can that experience be like where it doesn't get in the way, it doesn't feel, I hate getting into something that feels like the thing it should be, right? Like, we shouldn't already know this app that we've never used before because it's an app and that's how apps should be. Like, why? Why should that be? So we started looking at this thing and we love the content and we developed this language that is different than what we usually do. It's colorful and illustrative and icon driven. Um, and it ended up being a huge thing. Like this this app is is big and real and we hear people talking about it all the time, like like you know, no one knows we did it and they're talking about it, like, hey, did you see this app? Like, yeah, we saw it. Um, <laughs> but last summer we did it was kind of like one of those beta Silicon Valley moments. So the yeah. app was in beta for a long time, and then we did this big launch party. And um, John and Claire, who are our yacht friends, pulled strings and got all these amazing people there. And you have like Reggie Watts making fun of our app in front of a mural we did, and like all these like really you know young Jake rapping in front of like a neon sign of our identity, and all these like really weird moments because of a calendar we made that wasn't good <laughs> that turned into a t-shirt that we did for free for some friends and became this app that um, was great. And a side note, this is probably the biggest disappointment of our career, <laughs> is young Jake added Rick Ross to the guest list and he didn't show up. <laughs> and, I mean, it's fine. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, walk away. So you guys are all super valuable individuals. And I think often we think the client is the king, and we are here to, to do their bidding, which we are, because they allow us to live. But they also need you. You're doing half of this stuff, right? Like you are making the thoughts and things in their head become real. And you're going to be asked to do things that you don't believe in a lot of times, or things that you know are not the right way. And sometimes you can't make it happen. Sometimes reason is not enough. Um, and we got, we had this really big, there's a lot of almost stories in this. <laughs> um, we were working on this really big project and it was, it was a global chain. And we were branding it and, you know, we had the first meeting and it was like, it was a little weird, but there was really great people involved. And so we were, you know, we were like, yeah. We had also just like quit our jobs and went all in and yeah. like, fuck, we're set for the next year. Like, yeah, this is going to be great. Um, and things slowly started to snowball. And <laughs> we're designing things that are pretty outside of our comfort zone, but they're, they're really, you know, we're feeling good about them. It's right on what they asked for. But every week they asked for something different. And not in the point that it was like, okay, I know you're asking this because you're going to want to get to here, and then you're going to want to get to here, and then we'll get there. It's fine. But it, it was very much they weren't ready for it. And rather than go through this process, take the money, take the time, they it wasn't something that they were ready for, and it wasn't something that was going to be benefit us greatly at the time. And we, we want to work with people that we want to work with and that see us as partners. And so we were like, OK. We're going to let you guys gather your thoughts. We're going to step away. And then they're like, well, we're going to sue you. Like, OK, we'll talk about this. Um, so we talked about it with them. And it came down to, you know, we, we ended up writing a check to go do what we want to do. So we, yeah, we cut a, a big check to walk away from bigger checks because we didn't, we didn't think where it was going to go was something that we wanted to be a part of. And that, that moment, it was like a very, it, our career could have gone in a very different way had we gone down that path. And I think thinking about that next move was what allowed us to walk away. 
Um, the internet is an experiment, an experiment and experience. Um, and something that we like about the internet is it's not like print or it's not like other things that the parameters are predefined. You can do a lot of things with print and we mostly figured out what they are. We've been printing for a long time. Um, the technology is kind of where it's at. But with, with technology, with digital technology, we can change it. We can say, as the designer, we want the ability to do this. And we can make that, which is crazy. Like, imagine if you were a designer that invented paper because you wanted the place for your designs to live. You can kind of do that, which is fucking crazy. And um, that's something we like about the internet. Um, it also lets us collaborate with rad people, like uh, Sean Pecknold, who is a director in LA. He made this crazy series of short stories that are all character-based. But the problem with a lot of short films is you release them, you put them on Vimeo, and that's kind of like the environment. They're living in someone else's gallery. Um, and so we wanted to make an experience around that that's more about how he envisioned this living. That's not just a screening. It's not just hitting play. It's something that, you know, he, when you make a film, you make a world, and you want that world to echo out. And another, um, do you guys know C Chant? Who is? Whoa. Uh, C Chant. Whoa. Skip that, sorry. All right. But so C Chant is based here. They are amazing filmmakers, photographers, awesome people. Their studio is beautiful. Um, they created this film, and they created a book, and all these other things around it. And they didn't have a way to show it to people and really let people experience it the way that they had in their heads and when they were filming and all these other things. Um, so they, they wanted to make something kind of weird that told their story. And that's kind of the signifier that we want to be involved. How often do you guys read that print is dead? A lot. I'm so tired of things dying. Um, <laughs> but it's not totally dead. And sometimes it's really fun to make. And we get the opportunity to do books and to do magazines. And the cool thing about working on print and web is you find out they're about the exact same thing. It's moving a user through content or creating a story for users that engages them in an emotional way, whether it's like, I love the smell of the smell of paper, but I hate the smell of a stream. <laughs> but there's different things in there that you can pull emotion out, but it's not just smell. And um, stepping back and working on these things at the same time really lets them feed off each other, and you kind of start thinking about them differently. Like, if you designed a website thinking it's a book the whole time and it ends up being websites, it's kind of interesting that if you design a website with the intent of it being a website, because it's a website, that's a website, which is boring. <laughs> Clients are collaborators. Sorry, one second. How are we doing on time? Is it time to go over? We got 10 minutes? Yeah. All right, we're going to go fast. <laughs> we did, doing restaurant work is something we do a lot of. And the big thing with those is collaborating with them. They're opening, their, they want to sell their food at their place at their time. And you're an extension of that experience. And you really need to work with them to tell that story and to be a part of it. So this is Cooper's Hall, which is in Portland. Uh, so winery and and just to add, I mean, it's a lot again, like um, educating the client. You know, it's like clients, you know, especially for a restaurant, have a very specific idea, like, oh, I want reclaimed wood and I want this because that's what people in Portland are doing. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, it's like that's not the concept and that's not like the whole storytelling is this reclaimed wood and like, you know, it's what everyone else is doing. So really, kind of encapsulating <laughs> what Cooper's Hall was and what each one of those projects was. Okay. A, a few last lessons, and then you know as much as we do. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're all artists, which means we want to be satisfied creatively. And a lot of times, you forget that. You're graphic designers. You don't care. You make graphs. Um, <laughs> it's not true. Sometimes it is, but you still want that graph to mean something to you. And that's something that you know we continually struggle with, and I'm sure you guys go through it too, is unfortunately, you give a damn. And you want it to be good, and you want it to be meaningful, 
and you want to you know put yourself out there. Um, and then that's it. We're a working document. We might decide when we leave here that we don't believe any of those things, <laughs> but we did at one point, and that makes them valuable. Project M, and maybe yes. we, we've had a couple grads go into that program, and I feel like this would actually there'd be a lot of students in this room that would be interested in Project M. Too. Okay, awesome. Yeah, Project M was started by John Bielenberg. I am an alumni of that program. Um, basically, John brings together a group of different types of creatives. So it could be like a product designer, a writer, a photographer, a designer, a strategist, and then puts them somewhere weird. So. I went to rural Connecticut. You might take you to a weird part of Detroit or Iceland or something, and you have to come up with a project. That's it. You go there, and he says, OK, identify something. So when we were in Connecticut, there's all these beautiful farms, but everyone goes to the one chain grocery store. No one gets food from the farms. The farm stuff goes other somewhere else. So we're like, well, what can we do to show people that this stuff exists? So we did a giant pizza party mm. with local ingredients. There's there was weirdly someone that did like local crust. And we didn't, you know, we didn't make a book, we didn't design a logo, we designed this experience. We solved this problem in a different way. And that's kind of what Project M is about, is taking the way that we've been taught, how we go through problems and applying them into something bigger, something that you might not think of doing. And you should do it. Question in the back. So I know you guys do awesome work with uh, Camp Quiet in Virginia. And you guys are respectively California and Oregon. I'm curious if the name Public Library at all translates and how you guys are interdisciplinary uh, across many states. And, and maybe speaking largely about the name itself and why you chose it. Yeah, um, I suppose it does. I, um, <laughs> Camp Quiet is the developer that we work with. He's an amazing guy, and we bought his baby the first pair of Jordans. So <laughs> we're a big part of that baby's life. Too. Uh, but yeah, the name Public Library, naming things is super hard. And any, I mean, yeah, anytime you've gone through the process of naming, it sucks because everything seems like it's terrible or easy to make fun of. And so is getting called a librarian all the time. Like, yeah, I guess it's endearing. <laughs> um, but we love growing up. We spent a lot of time in public libraries, and the concept of them, where you can kind of go, you can go into a section and lose yourself in whatever books on dinosaurs or whatever, and then you can walk over and read like a George Washington biography, and just kind of this access to information and the ability to be in a lot of things that are still housed in one area was kind of kind of what we liked. Is like getting together at the library when you were a kid and reading a bunch of books all day and kind of falling down different rabbit holes. Mm -hmm. Reading books. Great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks, guys, very cool. much. Thanks, yeah.